What's up, fam? And welcome back to another episode. Today, I'm writing solo, and today we're going to be talking about the ever so difficult topic of sleep, how to naturally improve your sleep hygiene to fall asleep better and stay asleep. Uh, the reason why we're talking about this topic is because sleep is absolutely amazing for you. Literally any goal that you have, whether you want to improve your hormonal health, mental health, build more muscle, look leaner, perform better, and so much more. Sleep has such a huge hand in it. It's not even funny. I always say this, this is probably one of the biggest things that you want to invest in, put your, all the eggs in the basket on this one. But usually if you're like me, it's one of the things that you struggle with most because there's so many different little things that go into getting better sleep. A lot of different variables that is hard to tackle. And sleep is definitely one of those things that has been in my sock bucket for years. And I call it a sock bucket. Those things that typically usually people struggle with. It's part of the human experience. We all struggle with things. Sleep tends to be one of mine, as well as drinking water. I don't know why, but when I get stressed or busy, drinking water just completely slips my mind. And then I'm dehydrated as hell. So with that being said, we're going to dive into sleep, how to naturally improve your sleep. Um, some of the things are going to be just things to consider. Some of the things are going to be really simple things for you to apply to your day and or night routine. Okay. But first let's dive into why should you even care about sleep in the first place? Like I said before, sleep has a hand in literally everything that you want to achieve with your nutrition and fitness. It for first and foremost, it really does have a huge hand in your ability to stay lean. I don't know if you knew this, but your sleep can control, can completely control your hunger hormones. So your hunger cues, like, Hey, like the signal that I am satiated, I'm done eating or the signal of, Hey, I'm hungry. Those are controlled by leptin and ghrelin. Those are your two hunger hormones. And when you are sleep deprived, your body gets those mixed up. And so it's hard for you to rely on your hunger cues. And usually people that are a little bit more sleep deprived tend to get a little bit more snackier. That's why when you have better quality of sleep, you're able to get good enough sleep. Those type of people tend to be leaner than those who don't. Another thing is, is that sleep really does help you have a healthy metabolism. It has such a huge hand in your ability to build muscle and maintain muscle mass, which your muscle mass really does have a huge hand in how many calories that you burn every single day. It also has a huge hand in your hormonal health. Your th uh, hormones like your thyroid hormones has such a huge hand in your metabolism, how many calories that you're burning in the day. So people that typically get more sleep, have a higher metabolism. Therefore, it's a lot easier for you to maintain a leaner mass than those that don't. Going back to, again, it helps you build more muscle mass as well. If you're trying to get the leaner look or perform better in the gym or muscles also um, referred to as a longevity organ as well, those who have a lot of muscle mass on their body to a certain point, it directly correlates with having longevity in your life, a lot of independence your ability to build muscle mass depends on not only you breaking down the muscle tissue in the gym, but repairing it through recovery, through proper nutrition, eating enough calories, um, eating enough protein, but also managing your stress and sleeping as well. Remember, you tear down the muscle tissue in the gym, you build it back up through nutrition, lifestyle habits, and recovery, okay? The next thing is going to be managing stress and also your mental health, okay? Those who lack consistent amount of sleep tend to feel more stressed out, okay? When you are stressed, your body releases a hormone called cortisol. We all know that big old word, cortisol, which can make it harder for you to actually lose weight, especially around your belly. That's usually a sign is if you have higher amounts of cortisol levels within your body, you are chronically stressed, you'll start accumulating a little bit more belly fat, all right? This also has a huge, huge hand in your mental health as well. Not getting enough sleep is highly stressful on the body. And when you are chronically stressed, that really can decline your mental health, your ability to regulate your emotions, to concentrate, to be productive, to be resilient to the stressors in life. You tend to catastrophize things, get easily overwhelmed, um, tend to deal with things like anxiety and depression. It really does help with mental health too, which I know there's a lot of people that are listening to this podcast that not only is physical health a big focus, but mental health is as well. So sleep has a hand in both 
just your mental and uh, your mental and your physical health. All right. So sleep is an amazing thing, but I'm also going to share a fun fact with you. Okay. So there's a study done that's, uh, really shows how much sleep has a hand in improving your body composition as well, especially when you're going to a calorie deficit. This study has been referred to many, many of times. And by the way, guys, everything that I'm talking about is going to be in a helpful guide down below in the show notes with a link. If you want to learn, uh, look at the study that I'm referring to, you can look into the packet and look into the details there, but I'm gonna keep it nice and simple on the podcast. Okay. And so in this study, what they did is they took two control groups, okay? Both control groups consumed the same diet and performed the same activity levels, basically mirroring each other to try to keep it as unbiased as possible, okay? Both groups participated in the study for 14 days, right? The difference between one group and the other was just the amount of sleep that they got. One was 7.5 hours, the other is 5.5 hours, okay? Not a huge difference, only about a two hour difference. Both groups, here's the thing, both groups lost the same amount of weight, okay? But something that I always talk to my clients and those that are in our Strong Body, Strong Mind community is that weight is not the above all be all way to determine your goals. The question that we always need to be asking ourselves is what is that weight comprised of? We are entirely capable of losing majority of the weight that we lose muscle mass, especially if we're not focusing on the key things that help us maintain muscle mass. And so we're weighing less, we're shrinking ourselves, but our body composition doesn't really look much better. We're kind of getting that skinny fat look and our metabolism starts slowing down and we don't feel too great and we don't feel too strong in the gym. We actually feel like we're losing strength and losing performance as well. And so much more. We need to be very cognizant of what is that weight comprised of? Am I actually losing fat or am I losing muscle mass along with it? And so that brings me to comparing the two groups. Even though they pretty much lost the same amount of weight, the control group that only got 5.5 hours of sleep, 80% of the weight that they lost was muscle mass. Only 20% of that was fat mass. So actually, their body fat percentage got worse than when they started, even though they lost weight, versus the group that got 7.5 hours of sleep, lost only about 52% uh, muscle mass in comparison to 80% of the 5.5 hours. So only two hour difference, right? So your ability to maintain muscle mass during a fat loss phase when you go into a calorie deficit goes up significantly when you definitely sleep more, get an adequate amount of sleep. You throw in, eating um, enough protein every single day, making sure that you are properly strength training, creating the stimulus to keep on muscle mass as well. And other key factors like managing your stress is really going to help you maintain muscle mass. And on all, in all honesty, looking at the study, um, losing about 52% muscle mass, I wouldn't be too happy with those results. I would want to maintain even more than that. But again, what variables are they controlling? What are the groups working on? We don't know specifically, at least I don't know. I didn't look too deep into the study, just kind of read the meat and potatoes, but you see what I mean. Sleep is amazing for you. You're gonna really have a huge impact in your body composition. Okay, so what I'm gonna do next is gonna go over some key tips that typically help you get better quality of sleep, whether it's to fall asleep faster, um, get longer sleep or improving the quality of sleep. Now, with that being said, before I get into these things, what I want you to do is make sure that you're keeping a really good mindset towards things, okay? When it comes to sleep, for a lot of people, because again, like I said before, there's so many different variables that go into sleep, we can't just expect ourselves for a lot of people to just snap our fingers and like in a couple of weeks, it's magically better. There's a lot of different things that go into it. For example, I've struggled with sleep for years, probably about five, six years. About five, six years ago, I was a high level competitive athlete. I was training a lot. I was also, fun fact, sleeping in a gym. Part of being a full-time athlete in the weightlifting world, you don't get paid at all. Um, matter of fact, it makes you very poor. So in order for me to afford being a full-time athlete, I would legit live in the gym that my coach worked at and I would wake up and I would coach a class. I would train for about two to three hours. Then I would coach another class, then coach my online nutrition clients, then train for another two to three hours, finish up work, and then go to sleep, rinse and repeat seven days a week. 
Okay. With that being said, I was always um, trying to make weight. So I was extremely lean, extremely stressed, pushing my body to the limit and so much more. And it made it extremely hard for me to fall asleep. Fun fact, when you are stressed, it makes it a lot harder for you to fall asleep, whether it's psychological stress or physiological stress, either one, it makes it very hard for you to go to sleep. Okay. And so about that time, I was only sleeping about maybe five, five and a half hours on average, to be honest with you, it was really, really bad. And it was so bad that I almost got like, I, I started creating anxiety around sleep because I would try to force myself to sleep. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to sleep tonight. I'm going to try so hard. I'm going to lay in bed. I'm going to go to sleep and all these different things. And I just couldn't do it. And over time, it was just trying and trying and trying and not getting why I wasn't getting any more sleep, why I wasn't more tired, even though I was exhausted. I had extreme anxiety around it to the point where I dreaded nighttime. I loved waking up. I liked moving and all these different things, but I hated nighttime. Okay. The year after that was some work. Got about six hours of sleep on average. Year after that, six and a half. Year after that, seven. Year after that, seven and a half. Now, finally, I'm to the point where I actually enjoy sleep, where I'm like, ooh, it's bedtime. Let's go. I love my nighttime routine. I like, I hate waking up early in the morning. I'll do it, but I hate it. I actually want to stay in bed. That feeling alone was 100% worth it. I like, I feel so accomplished with that, but that didn't happen within a couple of weeks. For my personal experience, it took me years because I was overcoming a lot. So make sure that you have that mindset of, hey, this isn't going to be a, a dramatic change more than likely for me. What I need to keep in perspective is control what I can control now, take it little by little. And the big picture is, am I moving the needle forward day by day? If the answer is yes, then you're doing exactly what you need to be doing. You do not need to be perfect. You do not need to see night and day difference in terms of what you're trying to do within a couple of days or a couple of weeks. For some people, it'll take a long time like me. And that's 100% okay. It's neither good or bad. It's just your journey. Okay. So let's go into some helpful tips that do help generally a lot of people. You don't have to do all of them. I highly encourage you to do some trial and error and figure out what works best for you because that's where the magic happens, okay? But let's get into it. So um, I'm gonna break it up into like three parts. One, what you can do in the morning. Two, what you can do in the day. And three, what you can do at night, okay? So the first things first in the morning is going to be practicing getting up and going instead of hitting snooze, okay? And this is gonna go into, and I'm gonna dive a little bit into at night, is going to bed at the same similar time. The reason being is because one of the biggest things that can really help you fall asleep and get better quality of sleep is setting a routine because our bodies thrive off of the circadian rhythm. It is just a system in which our body revolves around where we wake up and we go to sleep. And usually there are signals in our body that helps us wake up and go to sleep. Serotonin, melatonin. Okay. There's a few other factors, but those are the big ones that a lot of people know. Okay. And so if we are always on an irregular schedule, we're going out to bed at certain different times, waking up at different times, it's really hard to set a circadian rhythm. And so it's really hard for your body to do what it needs to do in order to start falling asleep. So setting a clear system of I go to bed at this time, I wake up at this time as best as possible, even on the weekends, I'd highly encourage that. Now, every once in a while sleeping in ain't bad, okay? But just trying to create a consistent system really can help. You can see people that have a really good circadian rhythm is that they will wake up at pretty much the same time and they'll want to go to bed at pretty much the same time without even looking at their clock. They're like pretty much set. It's because your body's working with that circadian rhythm. It's sending the signals at the right time to wake up and go to sleep at the right time. Okay. Uh, another thing that you can do in the first thing in the morning is get some sunlight or some bright light about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes when you wake up. You can literally sit outside, drink your coffee, go on a walk. Um, you can also purchase things like a, um, a Lux LED sun lamp or something like that. But getting some sunlight first thing in the morning helps you get some serotonin and some vitamin B. This helps you wake up and just feel great and have a lot of energy as well, okay? And also, whenever you think about like days where you go out in the sun and you're in there for a long period of time, you're soaking up the sun, usually the nights we are out and we sleep hard. It's because when we absorb serotonin or serotonin, vitamin D, it converts into melatonin. So it helps us fall asleep really, really well at night. So if you can start the day off with some good sunlight, 
works really, really well, especially first thing in the morning. Okay. Um, the next thing and first thing in the morning is going to be get some movement in, go on a walk, do some yoga, mobility, work out, what have it. But once we get some movement in, we typically wake up right away, which again, helps us fall asleep later. Okay. Some other things that you can do during the day is one, um, wear blue light blocker glasses. Okay. Mi like limiting your exposure to blue light, especially as we're getting down to the later day can really help you downregulate towards the end of the day because blue light emits light like the sun. Okay. And remember when we're seeing the sun, our body is like, okay, it's time to be awake. But when the sun starts going down, maybe some orange lights because our brain has learned how to fall asleep to the fire because of caveman days, right? We can now start down regulating and start getting into a position where our body actually wants to fall asleep. It's starting to send the right types of signals to start falling asleep. So wearing blue light blocker glasses can help. Obviously the quality of the blue light blocker glasses definitely has a hand in things. You can have um, better quality ones than others, but something's always better than nothing, I always say, okay? Then from there, continue to get sun exposure throughout the day. I highly encourage anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes a day is a really, really great way to get more serotonin in your life and also get a little bit of vitamin D, which is fantastic for you. It's fantastic for you, so, so fantastic for you. But we've gotten into this habit of staying indoors, wearing lots of sunscreens, always wearing these hats. I am definitely down for not overexposing yourself to the sun, but we also need exposure to the sun. It's actually really great for us. So getting about 20 to 40 minutes of sun exposure, wear some sunblock, obviously, but it's really good for you. The other thing to consider is um, reducing caffeine. If you are relying on caffeine to get through the day because you're so tired, that's kind of like, hey, I have a problem. Let's throw some lighter fluid on it and just make it a big problem. It's kind of like a Band-Aid. Okay. And the more caffeine that you rely on, the more tired you're going to be late at night because you're going to be wired and tired because you drank too much caffeine. Okay. So at most 400 milligrams in the day cut off by 11 to 12, right? But like the less that you can drink, the better. I would say at the very latest, maybe 2 PM, but I would even encourage maybe 11 or 12. And if you make that change, yes, at the beginning, especially if you're a caffeine fiend, it may be a little bit harder, but it's going to be good for you in the long run. If you're somebody that's like, Hey, like, uh, but I like pre-workout after 2 PM. Like, what do I do? Get a non-stim pre-workout. They definitely have those that are, have beta alanine in it and some other key ingredients to help you feel like you're getting a pump, have a little bit more energy without the stimulus in it. So that's a really good alternative if you're wondering. The other thing is, is just establish like a routine period throughout your day. Like your body, your mind thrives off of routine. So if you can have the same routine of waking up, working out, eat, bedtime, uh, different things like that, that can really, really help. Uh, the other thing is just managing your stress. I know that's really hard, especially nowadays when we are exposed to social media, um, work, politics, news, all these different things that are happening in the world today. But managing our stress is really going to help be able to go to sleep later on. When our body is extremely stressed out, you can tend to start seeing that your sleep is going to decline. Okay. So adding things in like breathing exercises, meditation, stress relieving exercises as well, making sure that you're having constructive coping strategies as well and not destructive. So for example, a destructive coping mechanism is like drinking more alcohol or coping with food versus constructive could be going on a walk, hanging out with friends, um, coloring, what have it, just things that fill up your cup rather than empty up your cup. You can also rely on your friends and family, maybe get for some professional help as well. All things helping with managing your stress is going to be super helpful and getting more sleep too. Um, consider also um, reducing your exercise intensity and or increasing food intake. Because one of the signs, remember going back to uh, like if your body is stressed, body and or mind is stressed, you're going to see your sleep decline. One of the things that we keep track of with our clients when they are in a calorie deficit is what's called biofeedback. These are signals like hormonal signals that tends to come out in everyday life, like your quality of sleep, your digestion, your mood, your hunger cues, all these different things. If you start seeing that decline, you'll see like those are clear signals that your body and or your mind is extremely stressed out and we need to go into a recovery mode. So for example, if I have somebody that's in a calorie deficit, they start seeing their sleep decline, their mood decline, the hunger and all that stuff. That means their body is really, really stressed out and we need to either consider reducing intensity and or frequency 
of working out and or increasing their food intake so that their body is not super stressed. So that's something to also consider is if you've been in a calorie deficit, maybe under eating for a long period of time, maybe over um, under recovering, because there's no such thing technically as over training, but there is such thing as under recovering. You can reduce your fitness and or your calorie intake, or simply just focus on eating more if you're a stressed individual and forget to eat a lot or you're intermittent fasting or um, maybe you, you're just on educating how much you should be eating. And so you've been under eating learning your maintenance calories and crushing that could be super, super beneficial. Okay. Now let's go into some things that you can do maybe one to two hours before you go to bed or even closer to bed. So the first thing that really helps a lot of people is actually stopping to eat two to three hours before you go to bed. Some people really struggle with sleeping because their body is still digesting food. And digesting food can be a little bit of a process. And if you're still digesting food while you're trying to sleep, that can actually keep you up at night, right? So stopping about two to three hours of before you actually go to sleep may give your body a little bit more room to actually downregulate and fall asleep a little bit better. But I've also seen the quite opposite too. Uh, this leans a little bit more towards just from my own experience of coaching people, those who have um, more of a higher metabolism, perform a lot more, have a lot more muscle mass, some of my high-performing athletes, they actually slept better by eating a pre-nighttime snack because a lot of times if they go long periods of time without eating, their blood sugar might crash when they sleep. So eating something before they go to bed actually helps them fall asleep better. So it just is dependent on the person. I always suggest to my clients is like, if you don't know, try one or the other and see which one works out best for you and then stick with that because everybody's different, okay? And the next thing I'm gonna go to, it's a good segue, is just making sure that you are eating the right types of food before you go to sleep too. One of the reasons why a lot of people wake up in the middle of the night and they don't realize it is um, their blood sugar is crashing, going back to that. So if you're somebody that wakes up in the middle of the night and feels like you have to snack um, you're always reaching for something that might be a sign that you are trying to get your blood sugar back up. So one way to manage that is by eating things that are going to be a little bit more slower digesting, specifically more complex carbohydrates and pairing it with some type of protein source. You can also throw in like fiber um, and some type of fat source too, but making sure you're pairing that together will help make sure that your blood sugar stays nice and even throughout the night. So some really good examples are oats is a very great complex carbohydrate that you can do and you can add some nut butter to it. And then my favorite is always pairing it with uh, casein protein if your stomach can handle um, whey or um, lactose as well. And the reason why I say casein protein powder versus whey or whey isolate, those are three really, really popular forms of protein powder is because whey and whey isolate tends to be broken down really, really fast. It's great around your workouts because we want it to be broken down really fast. We want it to be easy on our stomach as well. Versus casein, it takes longer for your body to digest. So you stay satiated more, blood sugar stays more even, you pair it with a complex carbohydrate and it works magic. There's a lot of different options as well on top of that, but that's a common one that I typically suggest to people, especially if you like sweet treats before the night. Casein, in my opinion, just tastes way better than a lot of the protein powders out there, and it's easier to cook with. Um, and for a lot of casein products, you can also make a really, really cool hot cocoa drink. So you could do like oats with a hot cocoa drink as well. So it's just an example, okay? Then from there, make sure that you set an established bedtime routine. OK, remember, our brain needs to have certain signals release at certain times for us to wake up and go to sleep. And if you're just like going through your day and all of a sudden you stop and then you try to lay in bed and try to go to sleep, dude, you're going to be laying there for about like a half an hour, hour being like, why am I not tired? I don't get it. It's because you need a little bit of a system to help your body and your mind get ready to go to sleep. So establishing a bedtime routine, this is called sleep hygiene, right? Like you stop things at a certain time, you start getting ready, you set up your, your area, like maybe read a book, breath work, stretching, what have it to help you calm down, down regulate and get in the mindset of going to bed. Okay. So here's some examples. So, um, Calvin and I typically around seven, seven thirty. sometimes we push the limits a little bit. We're human, but around seven, seven thirty, we start turning off everything. We put everything on do not disturb or sleep. We start turning off the overhead lights. We start 
uh, doing a few other things that I'll go into that helps you um, get better quality of sleep. Um, we'll also put all of our electronics on our desk. We'll take a shower, we'll wash our face, all these different things. Um, we'll maybe sit down and watch a little bit of TV and then we'll start heading to bed around 8 39. Yes, both Calvin and I wake up fairly early. So we do get to bed around 8 30 or 9. Sometimes if I have it my way, it's even earlier than that because I'm a grandma. There's a reason why I have the nickname grandma is because I like to go to bed early sometimes. Okay. Some other things are going to be limiting your blue light. So that's one of the things that Calvin and I definitely do around 7, 730. Part of our routine is turning off our overhead lights, all the bright blue lights, our, our phone screens on my screen. I also have it on an automatic timer where you can go into settings and display and turn on your nighttime light. It'll start emitting more of a red pinkish light rather than a bright white or blue light. Going back to you, your blue light mimics the sun, the red light mimics the fire. So if you can start putting on lights that mimic fire, your body's going to start down-regulating. Your mind's going to start down-regulating a little bit more, which helps you get to sleep a little bit better. Um, so some things that we do is either put on some candle lights. Um, we got fake candles too because we went through real candles too fast and it was getting really pricey. So we got some fake candles. You can also purchase sun lamps or salt lamps. Sorry. You can get salt lamps and put it around. So um, it's kind of like shutting off the sun and turning on the fire. It really gives us a huge vibe. We also have string lights too. So the string lights have more like an orangish tint to it. It's not super bright. So it's got like a good like dim down vibe. You're kind of getting the nighttime routine and all that stuff. It's really fun. Um, so that's one of the things that you can do. Um, turning off your electronics, getting it out of your bedroom. Like seriously, no TVs, no laptops, no phones. Set that standard for yourself. Get it out of your bedroom. Don't put it in there. Keep it separate. Put it away at a certain time so that way you can start getting ready for bed. During this time, you can also start journaling, meditating, reading a book, maybe stretching, just different things that really help you get in the mood to fall asleep. And then another thing that I'm going to wrap it up with is going to be, oh, actually, no, I almost forgot something. This is one of my favorite tips for sleep. Oh my goodness. I can't believe I almost forgot this. Okay. So it's actually going to be a two-part. Here we go. So one of the things that your body really loves when it's trying to go to sleep is being cold. Because remember, caveman days, sun goes down, gets cold. We want to go to sleep. It's one of the reasons why when it starts getting cold outside, we tend to get a little bit sleepier, less motivation to move. We want to take naps more, all these different things. It's because our body just really starts getting tired when we get cold. Okay. So one of the hacks that you can do is actually, if you can control this, not everybody can, but if you can't control this, start turning your down your thermostat to about like 63 to 65 degrees at night. That's usually a good level for a lot of people to start getting cold, want to get cozied up and start falling asleep. Okay. If you can't control your air conditioning, then what I would say is either get like a fan and point it at you and or there's even uh, mattress pads that can cool things down. There's a really cool one. Um, it does cost a pretty penny, but it's a very well worth investment. I do not have it, but it's on my li bucket list of things to definitely purchase is um, it's called a sleep eight. So it's a mattress pad that you can manually control the temperature and you can control your side versus your partner's side. And so you can control it to a certain level. And you can also fun fact, add like an alarm or a timer where at a certain time the temperature start um, in increasing. So that way you start work waking up at a certain time. It's really, really dope if you can get that. Okay. And then your partner can control their side as well because everybody has their different temperatures that they like. So that's something that you can do. Um, another, so this is the second part. This is my really quick fix. If you are in a position where you are just so hyped up and, or you wake up in the middle of the night and you just can't fall asleep, what I would suggest is take a hot shower, whether it's before you go to bed and, or if you wake up in the middle of the night, you just can't go to sleep, take a hot shower. And the reason being is like, most people are like, hey, that sounds counterintuitive. I, I thought I was supposed to be cold, not take a hot shower. Here's the thing. What goes up must come down. So when you take a hot shower, your core temperature is going to go up. But your body is going to try to regulate that. And so your core temperature is going to start declining down. Okay. And so by the time you get out of the shower, your core temperature is still diving, diving, diving. And now you're more than likely going to be more ready to fall asleep again. This is something that I have used 
for I don't know how many years. I know that a lot of my clients have tried it too. I know that some of my clients actually add it to their sleep routine because it really does help them do that. If I am really, really stimulated or really stressed out, I'm like the wire tired where I know I'm exhausted, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to go to sleep. What I typically do is turn off all the lights in the bathroom, put like two candles in there. I'll put some like ohm music on, like some like low key music on, take a hot shower, just breathe in there, breathe in the hot air, come out, take my time, do my sleep routine. I'll do a little gua sha as well. Um, if you're not familiar with gua sha, it's like a tool that you can use, a, a little bit of oil in your face, a tool that you can use to really drain out your lymph nodes and take out a lot of the inflammation out of your face, makes your skin look healthier and so much more. Um, I'll do that routine and then I'll get in my PJs and I'll just like, I'm so much more relaxed by the time I'm done with that. Right. So those are some things that you can do in your day that are really simple that can potentially really help you with your sleep, whether it's falling asleep and or staying asleep. Okay. Now, obviously there are some supplements that you can use. I'm a big fan of using the bigger rocks. Like I talked before, rather than just relying on supplements, but supplements can really do help. Okay. So things like magnesium, L-theanine, valerian root, glycine, uh, 5-HTP, CBD is another one. And melatonin. Now I wouldn't suggest relying on melatonin all the time, but think of it as a good, better, best situation. Um, is it better than not getting sleep at all? Yes, a hundred percent. Um, but if it's something that you have to take every single night, then I would definitely suggest checking the big rocks, see if you can make some changes there. So you don't rely on melatonin because melatonin is a hormone that your body releases to go to sleep. Remember talking about that, but if you were to start taking it, your body is naturally going to stop releasing it because it's getting it from something else. So we don't want to become reliant on it. If you do use melatonin, try to get a slow release melatonin because if you get like a, a melatonin that releases pretty fast, you'll fall asleep for maybe four hours, but then you'll wake up in the middle of the night and have to take another one again. Not fun. Don't do that. Okay. Um, another two supplements that I always suggest to people, it's a, again, a little bit of an investment, but like if you're going to invest in anything, sleep, invest in your sleep, uh, you can try Ned Sleep. They have different forms of that. They have pills, tinctures, things like that, that also leans more into like hemp oil, CBD, and then also um, beam sleep. Beam sleep is something that I have used. Uh, by the way, we're not sponsored. We don't have any partnership with them. I've just used beam for a long period of time. It really, really helped. That does have melatonin. Um, so I'll have periods where I do use it and don't use it so I don't get reliant on it. But especially when I travel, I bring it with me because it's like, makes it 10 times easier for me to sleep when I'm traveling. And it also comes in like a drink form, like hot cocoa. I absolutely am obsessed with the peanut butter, the chocolate peanut butter one, very good, but there's a lot of other flavors that are really great for you too, okay? So I these are some helpful tips just to get started on falling asleep and staying asleep. If you wanna learn any more, go ahead and join our Strong Body, Strong Mind community. You can always ask questions there and join a dope community along with it. And also uh, the helpful guide that I was talking about, all the stuff that I talked about is gonna be down below in links so you can grab that and read it a little bit more if you're somebody that likes to read through things as well like me. There's a little bit more rhyme and reason as to why we're choosing these certain things and a few more resources for you to get at, okay? Other than that, I hope this helps. You sleep like a baby. Help this helps you become the CEO of your own health. If you ever need me, you know where to find me. You can find all the links below. Other than that, keep crushing it. Love you guys. Till next time.